My name is Carl Blythe, and I want to welcome everybody to CORAL's webinar today, presented by Joanna Lux, who is coming to us from Cornell University. Joanna is a senior lecturer in the French program, and of course she'll be talking to us about the project, her project, uh, Foreign Languages and the Literary in the Everyday. Um, but before we jump right into the webinar, let me just give you a little bit of advice about um, how to proceed in the webinar. This is going to be somewhat of a virtual conversation uh, aided by her slides, so she'll be talking off of slides like a PowerPoint. Um, we encourage you to ask questions and to make comments, and you see that you have a comment box. So please give us feedback during the um, during the, the presentation. We'll be bringing those questions and comments to her attention, uh, and then there will be a Q&A se session at the end. And also this webinar will be archived so that um, if you have to leave the chat room or leave, leave the room for any time, you can come back later on. And in a week or two, we'll have it posted on the CORAL website. You can then re-listen to it. And um, I also want to remind you that we're going to have a survey at the very end. This is actually very important for us because, of course, this is coming to you thanks to taxpayer money. This is US government funded. And these surveys are really an important requirement for us. So please help us help you by filling out the survey. It only takes just a couple minutes. OK, so let me jump to our first slide here. Um, the literary, foreign languages, and the literary in the everyday. As I mentioned, CORAL stands for the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. We are one of 16 national foreign language resource centers, and we're all funded by the US um, Department of Education as a Title VI grant. The FLIGHT, what we're calling F-L-L-I, uh, well, the, the acronym FLIGHT, Foreign Languages in the e Everyday, is actually a joint project between CORAL and another national foreign language resource center, and that's CIRCLE at the University of Arizona. Um, and so I have to get that out. And we'll be talking, to, we'll be talking about this website here. Uh, so flight.org, it's a very easy uh, uh, URL to remember. So if you want to follow up this, this webinar and visit our website, we ask you to do that. And you'll find uh, more information um, about this project. So um, as I mentioned, it's a joint initiative between CORAL and, and CIRCLE. And there are really five, or excuse me, there are really three co-directors. There's Joanna, who will be speaking today, and then myself and Chantel Warner, who I hope is joining us from the University of Arizona. And the three of us have been knocking around this idea for about a year. And the, the real idea behind this um, is to take Joanna's concept and to teach other people how to do this. It's essentially crowdsourcing foreign language materials. That really is the idea behind this. What we want to do, the three of us, me and Joanna and Chantel, is, is build a community of practice of foreign language educators helping each other develop really interesting um, kind of cutting edge materials for foreign language learning. And uh, um, Joanna has a kind of a multi-literacy approach, but she'll be talking more about that. She wants to extend meaning by playing with conventions. And she'll talk to you about what that means, how to play with the prototype. And, and centrally, really important to this approach is to bridge lower division and upper division. And that, of course, is that intersection between the literary, not just literature, but the literary, and then the everyday, which is really kind of that interesting intersection there. And the last thing uh, I want to leave you with before I turn it over, turn the floor over to Joanna, is this is um, part of a webinar series or part of a event series that we have for the um, flight. So in April, we'll be talking about how to create activities. After you learn today about the, co the basics of the, the, of the flight approach, then in April, we'll be having another webinar to talk about how to create the materials themselves. In July, here in, in Austin, if you can make it, we're going to have a workshop. And Joanna and Chantel and I will be available and hopefully helping people develop their own materials here at the University of Texas. And then in September next, next academic year, we'll be having another uh, webinar on copyright and open licenses, because that's really key to making to turning an educational resource into an open educational resource. OK, so that's pretty much everything. I'm going to turn it over to Joanna. And, uh, and Joanna, can you take it away? OK, so can you hear me? Carl, can you hear me? 
Well, I guess you know you can't yes. respond. So anyway, <laughs> okay. This is Joanna in Ithaca, New York, and uh, we've gone from the uh, warm climes of Austin, Texas, to the colder climes of Ithaca. Although today is in the 40s, so I'm not complaining. Um, before I begin, I would uh, like to say a very big thank you to the Coral team, to Carl and Natalie and Sarah and Pat, uh, not only for the work that you've done, of course, in, in making this webinar possible, but the flight project possible. Um, and then I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. So my first question, though, will be, can everybody hear me? And is the volume all right? Uh, if not, please uh, let us know. So apparently all is fine. Okay, so I wasn't actually sure how I wanted to begin this introduction to the flight project, but then I began thinking about the expression to take flight. So on the one hand, it means to take off and fly, and on the other, metaphorically, to flee out of fear. So it seems to me that there's a parallel with the title of, of my textbook, The Literary in the Everyday. On the one hand, with the mention of the everyday, foreign language teachers have a sense of can do. But the literary strikes fear into the hearts of some because it's interpreted to mean a text that's difficult to understand or that students may not feel prepared for or that's just not their thing. So the goal in large part today is demystifying what we mean by the literary and demonstrating how this understanding of language, not of literature per se, but of language, bridges the intellectual divide between language and literature. So um, as for the um, agenda for this uh, webinar, this first webinar in the series, I'll begin by developing the concept of the literary as it's used in this project. And then uh, we're actually going to work with two example texts, one in English, so that I can actually walk you through the steps of finding the literary in a text, and the other in French as an example of a flight text for beginning level students. And finally, I'll introduce social reading and a sequence of interpretation strategies that uh, exemplify at least uh, some of the flight project's pedagogical objectives. And then um, I will uh, be responding to your questions at the end. Uh, the flight team, or the choral team, I should say, will actually be fielding your questions uh, if you're writing them um, as this proceeds, um, but I'll hold off until the end to respond. Uh, so during this presentation, I will be referring to documents um, in the flight website, and if you want to access any of these documents, you will need to go to uh, the resources page, and actually I'll indicate that. So under the, under the um, how to um, a rubric at the very end, you'll see flight resources. Uh, so the uh, the full framework, in fact, for the for the literary and the everyday, represents the coming together of a number of strands of thought. But the way that I conceptualized the literary was inspired by prototype theory, as formulated by Eleanor Roche. So uh, prototype theory falls under the umbrellas of cognitive psychology and cognitive linguistics. And it has to do with how we categorize objects and experiences and what those words mean in mental representation. So Rasha's idea is that a noun has a prototypical meaning. And that consists of the best example of that category. So if we look here, uh, again, I'll try to do this. If we look here at the center, look at the center uh, of the circle, we see um, the prototype as Robin. And that actually comes from uh, polling uh, people in the United States, asking them what uh, uh, bird seems to best exemplify the concept of bird. And that's what a majority of people say. So Robin then constitutes the prototype or best example of that category. And then you have expanding uh, circles of increasingly different members of the category until you get to birds like penguins and ostriches, you can think of them as the outliers, that don't fly but that are in fact still birds. So applying this notion more broadly to how a language makes meaning, we can think of the range of meanings and uses that a word can have as metaphorical extensions of this prototype. And the word uh, metaphor, of course, comes from the Greek, uh, means essentially a transfer, a carrying over, or an altering of meaning. 
And so the flight project takes metaphor out of the more restrictive realm of, of it being a literary device, you know, a metaphor or a simile, and it uses it in its broadest sense. So a quote that I think sums up very aptly the integral uh, role that metaphor plays in language is this. Everything transcends the reality of what it is. Either you go mad or you learn about metaphors. So the first framing assumption for the flight project is that a language is a semiotic system of meaning making as opposed to a computational set of rules and exceptions. And then more specifically, a language evolves a core set of uh, prototypes, and this is what we talk about with forms in language uh, uh, teaching, for words, grammatical functions, syntactic structures, and sounds. These prototypes are then available for generating further meanings and uses through processes of metaphorical extension. And essentially what that means is you take the prototypical meaning, modify the form and or the context, and you create new significations. So um, another dimension of language that uh, prototype theory helps to bring to light uh, is that prototypes are culturally defined. Right? So if we go back to the example of bird, in the United States the prototype may be robin, but in Australia it might be parakeet. So uh, there are also individual uh, variations as well. So this understanding comes, or relates at least, to schema theory, and it gives rise to a second framing assumption for the flight project. And that is that we're talking about the literary as the metaphorical, as the plasticity of language, the resonances, the multiple layers of meaning that words or structures or texts can convey. So going even a step further then, these resonances tie language to the mental imagery of the speaker or writer. Right? So our imagery is shaped by our personal experiences, and the physical and cultural context that constitute the world of the individual. So in that sense, the literary is also emblematic of language as culture. Now, if you want to learn more about uh, the theoretical framework for flight, you can read the teacher's guide for my uh, textbook, which is linked uh, again in that uh, resources page. All right, so um, I'm going to show you a text that exemplifies this kind of language play. And it's actually the beginning of a short story by Ernest Hemingway. And uh, the title of, the, of this uh, short story is The Gambler, the Nun, and the Radio. And this is the opening paragraph, the first paragraph. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment to read the text and also to ask yourself this question. Does anything stand out or strike you as odd or unconventional? So I'll give you a moment to read and to reflect. The prototype of a narrative text is to begin with what's called the orientation. So introducing the characters and setting the time and place for the events to come. Now in terms of language use, this is conventionally accomplished, at least in part, through the prototypical meanings of the article system. So indefinite articles introduce unknown or new information, and then definite articles refer back to those noun ideas that are noun known or old information. So, but here, however, we see that um, Hemingway begins his story with definite articles and pronouns, and that forces the reader to fill in the contextual gaps. And one way we do this, one way that we have of knowing which things are being referred to, is from whole to part relationships. So if you introduce the idea of a hospital, you can then talk about the corridor and the night nurse, etc. So, in fact, what's interesting is that Hemingway omits the whole, and he refers to the parts, but we can still piece together what he means. Now, starting a narrative with definite articles is actually a recognized uh, literary technique, right? It creates the effect of jumping into a story that's already begun, and we feel motivated or intrigued to make these kinds of mental deductions from the given context clues. But here's the thing, that Hemingway actually goes further to do something that I've never seen before. He extends the notions of indefiniteness and definiteness even farther to further subvert the genre by creating a temporal shift with articles. So let me show you the second paragraph, and I'll ask you to take a moment and read it.
Okay. So using indefinite articles in the second paragraph, Hemingway introduces his characters by shifting to a time when the reader did not yet know them. And this is a temporal shift that would more prototypically be achieved by uh, the use of the past perfect tense, since the story begins with the use of the preterite. But Hemingway, in fact, maintains the use of the preterite for both events and creates a shift instead from known to unknown through articles. Now, uh, native users of English can fill in these contextual gaps automatically from intuitive knowledge of English. But for language learners to make meaning out of this text, it's essential that they have explicit knowledge of the prototypical meanings for indefiniteness and definiteness. And from there, they can begin to interpret how Hemingway plays with these meanings metaphorically so that he can identify, or so that this, the reader can identify, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why of the story. So, going back to Eleanor Roche's uh, prototype theory, she points out that the best way oops, to learn a concept is the best way to learn a concept um, is by uh, teaching uh, or showing, sorry, the, the, the best way of teaching a concept is by showing a best example or the prototype. But here's the rub. Uh, in standard foreign language practice, teaching practice, there's a long-held assumption that students at the lower levels should only learn the prototypes of a language, so the primary or concrete meanings of words and the rules of grammar. And only when they reach the higher levels should they begin to work on the metaphorical level. However, if learners are not exposed to metaphorical uses of language, or what I call the literary, they cannot gain mastery of how a language makes meaning. And ironically, by working with the literary, it helps to clarify and reinforce understanding of the prototypes, which improves students' accuracy and appropriateness in language use. So the flight project embraces the fact that all aspects of language have the potential for the literary. This understanding allows the project to respond to the challenge set forth in the MLA report of 2007, which is to say that the literary can be found in the language of the everyday and scaffolded from the beginning. And fear not, teachers and students can begin by working intuitively. So the first step for teachers is finding the literary in a text. And to help you to uh, accomplish this, we propose the following categories for the literary. Um, and all of these categor categories relate to this idea of generating new meaning. So generating new meaning via uh, sound play, visual play, word play, grammar play. And here we mean things like uh, paradigm subversion and grammatical metaphors. Genre play, which can include genre mixing and intertextuality. Pragmatic play, perspective play, by playing with different points of view and perspectives. Symbolic play, and finally, culture play, right? Subversion of cultural practices and products. So uh, to give you uh, some examples of this, to flesh out the idea a little bit more, I'll give you a moment to read through these and see uh, if this so in the Hemingway text, I, I find you know, <laughs> I found genre play, and um, but the subversion of storytelling conventions and grammar play, right? The subversion of the conventional dynamic between indefiniteness and definiteness. So um, in the resources page of the Flight website, there is a document called "Finding the Literary in a Text," and it includes. Um, a longer excerpt, in fact, from uh, Hemingway's story, along with this list of meta-categories to help you to discover these dimensions in the text. And here's the thing to keep in mind. You may interpret the categories that I've outlined differently, or you may find other categories in the text that you would prefer to exploit pedagogically. <clears throat> and that's exactly the point. right? So this kind of work is about how texts make meaning, and there are often a number of ways of interpreting the same information. But here is a tip. <laughs> Be careful to always work with the original version of an authentic text. If, for example, you want to apply notions of the literary in the everyday to a literary text in the textbook that you are currently using, be mindful of the fact that textbooks sometimes edit out the literary. Right? And this is how deeply ingrained this assumption is to not expose students to metaphorical uses of language at the lower levels. 
So um, to further help you in exploring these dimensions of language play, the Flight website also provides a number of example lessons, and these are all centered on texts that encode one or more categories of the literary. Uh, and we're going to look at it an example in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to first address the question of what the everyday in the literary and the everyday means. So, uh, you know, pretty simply, it means the, the language and uh, textual prototypes that can be either written, spoken, or visual, right, text in all of its uh, many uh, uh, instantiations, and used for everyday communication. So, everyday, that can include everyday genres, things like singles ads, personality questionnaires, jokes, social media, also literary genres about the everyday, that could be anything, but for example, poetry, fairy tales, narratives, essays, and then also literary references that are recontextualized in the everyday. So things like blogs, graffiti, memes. You know, we often in, in our everyday communications and, and lives make reference to uh, um, uh, literary uh, texts and images and uh, film um, and incorporate that um, um, to share uh, with our uh, interlocutors. So the example lessons on the website in French come from my open textbook, Le Littéraire dans le Quotidien. And the example lessons in German come from Chantal Warner's work with the literary in the digital everyday. And uh, I'll show you now an example from the first chapter of my textbook. So you see here the frontispiece uh, of this first chapter. And actually, um, I include a frontispiece in, in, for each chapter um, because I want to include visual play um, for pedagogical purposes, right? So it's an image that encodes layers of meanings tied to chapter content. So this chapter, as you can see at the top, is called uh, What's in a Name? Because it's a play on words with the French word nom, which means name or noun. And it was designed to address a grammar problem that students encounter right at the start of their study of French. So in standard commercial textbooks, uh, the first chapter typically introduces students to nouns in order to anchor the notions of gender and number. And these nouns tend to be tied to the vocabulary of the classroom and to the functional language of introductions, and in particular to identifying someone's profession. And this is fairly typical uh, as a way of starting uh, language study uh, uh, across languages. But here's the problem in French. In French, base nouns, meaning a noun without uh, an article, are used attributively when naming someone's profession or status. So you say in French, elle est musicienne, il est étudiant, but in the English equivalent, you would have to use a noun with the indefinite article. She is, she is a musician, he is a student. So in standard textbooks, this usage uh, in, in French is treated as an exception. Right, so one of the classes of nouns, so everyone talks about, oh, names of professions, of religions, and political parties, those are the nouns that you can use in this uh, structure and in this way. But uh, as a result, it remains a sticking point for learners, right? So they want to keep adding in that indefinite article when they write this very simple uh, sentence. But here's the interesting thing. It turns out that all nouns in French can be used attributively when properly contextualized. And um, this is what it, uh, this looks like in spoken French. So imagine a scene. Two students arrive in a room to study for an exam. And this is their exchange. Tu es plutôt table ou bureau? So do you prefer studying at a table or at a desk? Moi, je suis très table. So me, I'm more of a table person, or I'm more into studying at a table. You could say things like, il est très ordinateur, or, he's a real computer freak, or, ils sont vraiment café, they're really coffee crazy, right? So um, these are examples of grammatical metaphors, and because the literary is not included in lower level textbooks, this structure is never taught, even though it's a very productive pattern in both informal spoken language and in poetry. So. In fact, the text for this first chapter <clears throat> is a poem. And it's an authentic poem written by me. So, okay, I'm sure you can guess that 
I'm not a native user of French, and no, I didn't uh, write this uh, for a Francophone audience. So why do I say authentic? Well, unlike an auth a non-authentic text, which has been expunged of the literary, creating metaphorical meaning gives the writer or speaker poetic license. And I think this distinction is important in two ways. It helps us all to think more deeply about what we mean by the term authentic. Uh, this is a term that's used widely and on, in one sense, yes, it, it means, uh, you know, written by uh, a, Frank of, uh, a native user or equ equivalent and for um, a native, native user audience. But in fact, authentic can uh, mean other things as well. And I think uh, we all need to think a little bit more deeply about what this term uh, indicates. So the second thing is that it's empowering, right? So by giving ourselves and our students permission to play with language systems, right? So it's not just play for play's sake. I mean, there is, <laughs> there are very real uh, um, um, systematic kinds of ways of working with language. It creates more authentic users of the language. So the title um, of this poem is C'est tout un poème which means literally, it's a whole poem. But metaphorically, uh, it's used in the way that we do in English to say something like, oh, it's a whole story, or it's quite something. All right, so I'm going to read each verse in French, and I'll give you a gloss in English. And I'd like you to think about what the meanings might be of the hi highlighted pronouns that are used attributively. So, je vous présente Aaron. Il est étudiant en sciences politiques, mais en linguistique, il est plutôt escargot. So, some of you probably know, or maybe all of you, escargot means snail as a noun. So, the idea here is, so let me introduce you to Aaron. He's a student in political science, but in linguistics, he's pretty... Hmm, so what can escargot mean attributively? Well, he's pretty snail-like, or sluggish or slow. So, dans la salle de classe, il y a un tableau, un morceau de craie et un exercice avec le verbe être. Mais Aaron est très fenêtre. So, in the classroom, there is a chalk, uh, um, a blackboard, a piece of chalk, and an exercise with the verb être. So, être is the verb to be in French. But Aaron is very Okay, so the noun fenêtre means window. So here, you can't just make a kind of uh, associate, a direct associative uh, a thought as you can with snail to snail like or sluggish. Here you have to really go into the scheme of what's happening in order to make sense of this. So you have to envision in your mind's eye a classroom with a student that we know is not uh, uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, intrigued or, 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 or quick or, or, or uh, plugged into uh, his study of language. You have the blackboard and you have a window. So what might, what might that window's relationship be to the student? Well, the student is very busy looking out the window. He's actively looking out the window. So you could say that he is very distracted. Right? Aujourd'hui, on est lundi. Après, il y a la semaine et puis samedi. Dimanche, mais au oh, le weekend, Aaron est très labo. And on my screen, the word labo is uh, not not uh, visible, but anyway. Um, today is Monday, and then there's the week, and uh, after that, the, there's the week, and then Saturday, Sunday, but oh, on the weekends, Aaron is very, so labo is short for, uh, it's like lab, short for, for uh, laboratory. Again, you have to think about the activity that might be associated with being in, in a laboratory. So we associate that with um, being very industrious, working hard, experimenting. Mm -hmm. So any of those uh, um, attributive adjectives might work. Comment? Qu'est-ce qu'il fait? Ben, Aaron apprend le français. Sa nouvelle petite amie s'appelle Marie. Elle est de Paris. So how's that? You know, what does he do? Well, Aaron is learning French. His new girlfriend's name is Marie, and she is from Paris. So it is, in fact, 
tout un poème, right? It's a whole story, but students can piece it together even with this metaphorical uh, usage of language because using very simple language and grammar but including grammatical metaphors provides students the opportunity to work more fully with the noun system and to make meaning right from the start that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And for those of you who don't reach for, read French, the instructional language in uh, many of the chapters is primarily English. So you can go through the textbook um, to see how the texts are treated pedagogically. All right, so um, I've been talking about how teachers can work intuitively in finding the literary and texts. And in a similar vein, the Flight Project proposes best practices for helping students to develop effective skills for working with the literary. And this fits quite nicely into a multiliteracies framework. Uh, so uh, Pazani, uh, Willis Allen, and Dupuis in their book, A Multiliteracies Framework for Collegiate Foreign Language Teaching, outline four pedagogical acts of what is referred to as meaning design. All right, so how meaning is uh, constructed um, for helping students right, to develop um, effective skills for working with the literary. Um, the the um, strategies that I'm going to be uh, talking about actually fit nicely into a multiliteracies framework. And so here I'm citing uh, Paisani, Willis Allen, and Dupree's book, A Multiliteracies Framework for Collegiate Foreign Language Teaching. And in that, um, they outline four pedagogical acts of meaning design. So meaning design has to do with um, how uh, meaning is, is, is constructed and, and uh, communicated. Okay, so the four uh, pedagogical acts begin with uh, situated practice, and that has to do with experiencing using um, the, the foreign language to participate in authentic uh, activities. And here again, we might uh, rethink uh, uh, the, the notion of authentic activities, keeping in mind now the notion of the literary. Uh, overt instruction has to do with explicit learning related to language use and conventions. Critical framing, so that's in analyzing functionally and critically. And then finally, transformed practice, which has to do with producing language in new and creative ways. So um, I was saying that in this webinar, I'm actually not going to be touching on how writing is treated in the flight project. But I will now refer to um, the document in the resources page that's called Interpretation Strategies and Social Reading. So social reading, if you're not uh, familiar with it, is um, an internet-based activity in which students collaboratively read, annotate, and comment upon a shared text. And there are many applications that can be used for, to, to accomplish this, uh, but I actually use eComma. And uh, eComma is a web application that was created by Coral, right? So it's, uh, uh, I use it because it's an open resource, meaning it's free to be used and adaptable. And I also use it because it was specifically designed for pedagogical application of social reading. So you can see on the left side of the screen, on the left side of the, the screen in that column, you see the text that was entered. And this is in the demo uh, for the eComma uh, link. And then on the right side, you see a word cloud. And that word cloud is generated uh, from the frequency uh, of um, instantiations of words and uh, punctuation in a text. And then in the middle, you have these various um, icons. And I'm going to talk about uh, two of them, sort of function buttons. So the asterisk in the center indicates the comment thread. And uh, that's the cumulative list of comments or annotations made by the participants. And in this case, you can see that there were 82 annotations that were made. So when you click on that icon, it brings you to the comment thread. And um, if you um, want to, then you can, you can see here the word highlight. So what, what people do is they actually highlight a word or a passage in the text. That opens up a window. They write their comment. They post it. And uh, if in interacting, because people are collaboratively reading, uh, if they want to see where that uh, word or passage is, they click on highlight, and that brings them to where that is in the text. 
Then if you look below that, there's a, 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 a sort of a person icon, and that brings you to the list of users and their annotation count. So what that looks like is this, and uh, this is a very neat tool for, for um, teachers because it allows you at a quick glance to see who uh, participated and how many annotations the numbering is rather small here, the text is small, but how many annotations that you know each person has made. So um, you can either then uh, uh, read all of the annotations in the, in the comment thread either by using it on screen or you can print um, out the, uh, the thread um, if it's easier for you for analysis and grading, uh, which I'll actually get back to in a moment. So I'm going to show you now four interpretation strategies that can be used actually uh, quite fruitfully with social reading. And my inspiration for this um, came from uh, the field of anthropology and ethnography in relationship to the phenomenon that's referred to as rich points. Now rich points, very simply stated, are instances of two cultural constructs, constructs that come up against each other. Right? So this is something that often causes problems for comprehension when reading in a foreign language, right? A word, uh, and when you think about prototype theory, it's this, it, you know, ties back to this notion of, well, it might be a robin for me, but it might be a parakeet for you, right? So what are uh, uh, the very uh, um, associations uh, uh, and, and schemas that are attached to, to words and concepts? So the question I wanted to answer is, how can we help students to recognize these tension points? I mean, it's one thing as teachers to point them out uh, uh, when, uh, when it's appropriate. But really, um, students need to learn on their own to, to develop a sense of, uh, uh, of awareness for recognizing these tension points and for better negotiating meaning. So the four strategies that I came up with, which again, tie in so nicely with the technology of um, social reading, are these. So the first is what I call red flagging, and I say, Read with your gut. Whenever you experience a point of tension, surprise, annoyance, curiosity, disapproval, confusion, flag the word or passage by highlighting it, and then write a comment that identifies your reaction and the source of tension that produced it. Uh, once uh, people start, you know, posting uh, uh, these, these kind of red flags, then as you're reading through, you're questioning both the text and the assumptions that are that are inherent in, in, in these red flags. You know, you want to get at what might be going on here. We don't know, the reader doesn't know, but how might we start to uh, unpack what's happening. So because this is internet-based, you can then find evidence either by looking at the word cloud or by doing an internet search. Uh, so you can work uh, to gain, gain knowledge uh, as you're uh, questioning and then finally posting some kind of uh, formulation of an evidence-based interpretation. So I've used uh, social reading and these strategies at the first year level with students writing their comments in English and also at the second year level where they have the option of writing in French or bilingually. And um, there are of course any number of ways that you can use social reading but I uh, use it as a uh, first reading of a text because it allows students to uh, react and question a text in this kind of informal, peer-mediated environment, I don't intervene, right? And as a result, they tend to notice more and to be willing to take more risks in making meaning out of a text. And in fact, this activity provides a, a way of combining three of the pedagogical acts that were proposed uh, by the uh, multiliteracies framework. So when you think about situated practice, overt instruction, and critical framing, all three of these acts are uh, taking place, but in a learner-centered process that's aimed at helping students to develop a more intuitive and empowering skill set for interpretation. I want this to, uh, to imply that by, by students actually using these strategies that suddenly their interpretations are um, always accurate and, and well-founded, right? <clears throat> but what's important is that this process allows teachers to see where students are really having problems with comprehension and how they might best address those problems in follow-up work. <clears throat> so um, the document <clears throat> on this topic in the flight website contains an explanation of um, the theoretical framing, a breakdown of these interpretation strategies, 
an example activity for students of French, and an example of a grading rubric <clears throat> that you could use or modify. <clears throat> and that, of course, you know, is a really important um, aspect um, now, um, as opposed to a certain number of years ago, is finding ways to um, identify what the criteria are for how we grade our work. So um, rubrics are um, important to share and to um, develop. All right, so I uh, began this uh, webinar with <clears throat> outlining um, the framing assumptions for the flight project, and I'll end which is good timing for my voice, uh, by saying that the concept of the literary in the everyday underscores a transdisciplinary approach that, when applied from the beginning, establishes common ground for connecting language, literary, and cultural studies, but it also contributes to the integration of the teaching and learning of foreign languages in a digital humanities. So um, I hope now, from this grounding, you feel ready to take flight couldn't help but add that in at the end. Okay, so um, we would love to see submissions of materials in any foreign language because actually um, I don't know that that was made clear. The, the long-term goal uh, uh, of this project is that we're creating this, this archive uh, that's going to be multilingual. <clears throat> we already have examples in French and in German, <clears throat> but we're extending the possibility for, um, for any of you to um, submit um, uh, materials that you create in this vein that will be peer-reviewed and also supported in the process of, of this creation so that we can help you to produce viable and innovative materials in this vein, right? So as Carl mentioned, <clears throat> the next webinar will focus on creating, I'm not sure actually, did you did you say the topic of the next lesson, uh, next webinar? It will be creating flight lessons and activities. And we're also looking to invigorate uh, the Facebook page which is only open to members, uh, because we're hoping that we can have some sharing of postings that might help us all to go further in thinking about the literary. So stay tuned. And as Carl did mention, please fill out this Coral webinar survey. And uh, I now, in fact, can answer the questions. First question that's already just come in, Joanna, where do you get your ideas for texts and activities? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, uh, you know, Carl mentioned at the beginning that I <clears throat> had started by uh, wanting to, to adopt and adapt um, uh, Français Interactif. So I did have a kind of thematic progression and um, grammar syllabus that I was sort of working uh, uh, against or uh, in conjunction with, right, to create um, um, uh, spin-off uh, uh, kinds of materials for literacy. So that was one thing, and um, I, and I have to say that uh, uh, it took me quite a long time to come up. I mean, the, the first uh, uh, text was one that I wrote, um, but the others are all things that that uh, I found on the internet. Internet um, and Chantel uh, Warner also uh, for German uh, has done the same. So um, it, it's easier now to find things because this was uh, maybe five years ago when I first started working on this. And uh, at the time, things weren't always um, labeled. Um, you couldn't find um, the status the, the, of um, you know, open uh, as readily. But more and more things are, are being labeled as such. So that will actually be part of the third uh, that will be the focus of the third webinar. Uh, Carl will be <clears throat> telling you about, you know, how you can really understand uh, finding open resources on the internet. But here's the other thing: is that um, if you, you can also rethink the text that you're using in a textbook that you may like, but that you may think, hmm, I'm not happy with uh, uh, the the presentation or, or or the kinds of activities that are that are. Um, um, presented around around that text. So go to the original version, if, if, that's, uh, if it's been modified, and rethink it. Look at hmm, what may be uh, in here that I, I can uh, approach very differently so that I can <clears throat> bring in the literary in the everyday. So I hope that answers your question.
can I jump in here again? There's another yes, question that was asked about using a copyrighted text. So the one that you gave, you made it up, um, or using an open. What um, some people asked about: what uh, what if they have a copyrighted text from their textbook and they wanted to develop their activity? What do they do then? Hmm. Right. So there there are two things. You can either work with an open text or a closed text, closed meaning uh, copyrighted. And in the event of a closed text, um, you wouldn't include the actual text in the lesson. You would include um, a, a link or a reference uh, uh, to it so that uh, your lesson would be open around a closed text. So you could still submit materials for uh, copyrighted uh, um, text just as long as you don't include that text in the actual materials. I do see a question uh, from Dick. Aren't jokes and puns like likely sources of examples of the literary in the everyday? Would it be useful to generate examples to even have students look for jokes? Uh, actually, I do include jokes. If, if, uh, if um, you look in my, um, I forget which chapter they are now, but there are actually two chapters um, that work with jokes. Yes, jokes are, are um, a wonderful uh, uh, source for um, different kinds of language play, whether it's uh, uh, grammar play or uh, um, uh, word play or uh, interactional or you know perspective, anything. Yeah. All, uh, any genre potentially could could include because in fact it's not about the genre necessarily it's about language right and all language has the potential to be uh, literary to be used metaphorically ah so I see a response but second language learners do not usually understand jokes well that's true and that's one of the reasons why it might be a very rich <laughs> point for investigating uh, going deeper of what what is happening and sometimes even in you know people say well um, you know it, it, it loses uh, the humor in translation um, but but um, there can be um, a real depth of, of understanding that comes out of unpacking uh, a joke um, and if that gives uh, learners a, a little bit of a of an insider sense of um, of humor uh, in that culture, then I think that that it's a very uh, um, you know, useful and and beneficial uh, thing text to to, to deal with. Um, um, Tom, uh, Tomer, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, so that they might, you're saying that uh, with jokes, they they they. Um, they feel that, that, that they're silly. Um, some of that's going to depend on the joke that you choose. Uh, there are some jokes that really get at um, cultural constructs, right, that, that, that um, may exemplify something that actually students find um, important or, or, or intriguing to understand. And if you can, in fact, um, in one chapter where I use this, it's actually for understanding, uh, because I tie it in with um, business culture in France. So, um, um, you know, if you can tie it into understanding certain practices in a, in a particular uh, uh, subculture that may be of interest to, to students, that that uh, then takes on, you know, another level of importance. Joanna, can you hear me? Yes. This is Carl again from Coral. And let me, uh, since we're coming up in the hour, just about to finish, um, would you Tell people just a little bit about the idea uh, behind Flight that this is, as I mentioned at the outset, this is a community of practice that we're trying to build and that the website itself is going to be an archive so that people can contribute to that. Could you just mention that to them, tell them a little bit about that? Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm not, I did, I don't know if you heard, <laughs> I, I, I did uh, uh, address that, but I can, I can say it again. Um, so the, the this project, which which really started with with my textbook, right? The the, the textbook became a springboard then for uh, this joint uh, um, um, funding through the Coral and um, uh, Arizona University of Arizona Circle. So the idea is to expand it not only then from French but to any language, and so we're creating 
um, on the flight website we're, we're having uh, a space for um, in a sense a repository or archive so that people can submit materials in the vein of the foreign uh, foreign languages and literary in the everyday um, but they're peer reviewed so it's not just oh gee okay I'll, I'll put something together and, 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 and upload it no they, they are peer reviewed and uh, in that process uh, we can help you to uh, really produce materials that are um, you know uh, uh, viable and uh, innovative uh, uh, in this vein and they would be published as open uh, resources so you go through the licensing and yeah. this is something that we're excited about in terms of thinking that uh, language program directors um, in um, universities can include this in their methods courses and actually then have graduate students when they go out onto the job market have yeah. in their CVs um, you know uh, the fact that they have um, successfully published uh, you know materials that show that they are thinking deeply about language and literature uh, and that they were accepted for publication on the website. And I'd like Is to that, follow up then. Yeah. yeah, that thank you very much. That that um, leads right into an announcement that I wanted to make as Natalie's just po posting Coral is starting a new collaborator program. We're going to call it Coral Collaborators. And as um, as Joanna just said, we want language program directors to be working with their graduate students and we will award them some kind of a stipend for their participation. So the creation of a flight activity um, I believe we're talking around $500 and um, we would then all, in addition bring them to the workshop here in July so if you have uh, graduate students who are interested in that we would really uh, we'll give you details but you can find out those details about the Coral Collaborator Project um, and again it's to seed participation in our various projects but in particular the flight project is what we want to focus on this summer uh, it's for graduate students to bring them uh, here to UT Austin and to help them develop their own materials. So we are up, we are, it's, uh, the hour is up. I want to thank everybody and, and especially Joanna for her presentation. And um, the, as I said at the beginning, I, I want to end with this. Please take the survey. It should only take just a couple of, of minutes of your time and it's important for our record keeping. Uh, and uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.